Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to be begin a new series in Philemon, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast together on your word. We're so grateful for your love. I just ask that you would help us to better understand your love for us and our love for one another. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is the truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, our original website, blessedhopeforever.com, is back up uh, after moving from one server to another. So I invite you to go there and look at what's new. Philemon, the epistle of Paul to Philemon. I want to start this new study by refreshing your memories and emphasizing once again that the Holy Spirit is the author, not Paul. Uh, Paul was his tool, but the author is the Holy Spirit. It's the epistle of God, the Holy Spirit, to Philemon. I think most of you have probably uh, heard sermons on this sparkling little gem. It's loved by every minister. You can cover the book in one message, and, and multitudes have done that. There's a credible amount of history behind the book. Apparently, Onesimus was Philemon's slave. And as the story goes, he ran away. And now, of course, he's a criminal under the laws of the state at that time, which was punishable by death. Please bear in mind that the times in which these epistles were written Animals had more rights than slaves. Citizens had lots of rights, but not slaves. A man could be imprisoned for torturing his horse or his dog, but he could do anything that he wanted with his slaves. And Onesimus was apparently running for his life. We'll see as we go through the epistle that Onesimus was where he, wa he was uh, Paul was where he was, by the sovereign direction of God, which is a point that's almost always missed. And somehow or another, we were told that, well, he stumbled into the Pacific Garden Mission in Rome, and he ran into Paul where he was converted, and Paul sent him back with this letter so that Philemon would forgive him and restore him to fellowship. And uh, that's pretty much the story. And it's true. I don't want to miss the, the purpose of the letter and the epistle by scrutinizing it so closely that we miss the overall beautiful illustration of the finished work of Jesus Christ. However, I am of the opinion that that, that finished work will become more brilliant if we look uh, just a bit more closely at the verses. And we don't rush through this, these 25 verses. The epistle begins, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Now, this is a rather interesting first verse. The, the Holy Spirit may have used Paul as a tool to write 14 letters that are included in the canon, you know, were we're quite certain that he used him for 13, but whether he wrote Hebrews or not, or at least whether the Holy Spirit used Paul to write Hebrews, we're not certain. But of the 13 epistles, let me refresh your memory. In Romans, Paul says that he's a slave and an apostle called by God. In 1 Corinthians, he says he's an apostle called by God. In 2 Corinthians, he says he's an apostle called by God. In Galatians, he says he's an apostle. 
In Ephesians, he says that he's an apostle. In Philippians, he says that he's a slave, a bondservant. In Colossians, he says that he's an apostle. In 1 Thessalonians, we have the first break in that chain. He doesn't say anything. He just says Paul. And all of a sudden, in the, in the epistles to the Thessalonians, we find that there is a message of fellowship and communion with the body of Christ, and it's just Paul. And that's the first break in that chain of authority. When he writes to the Galatians, the Holy Spirit wants the Galatians to know that the Holy Spirit is using Paul as a commissioned apostle. The word apostello puts emphasis on the sender. And so the emphasis is on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the message to those in Galatia was one of grace versus law. How easy it is to for the Christian to go back to law. Somehow or another, he demands a synergistic cooperation with God in his redemption. And he cannot believe that grace can be grace. There must be something in, in, in us that would lead us or lead God to, to love us. That's, that's your normal experience. There are people you like and people that you don't like, and the reasons for that emotion are, are reasons vested in the individual that you're liking or not liking, but that is not the grace of God. When we were enemies, when we were not seeking Him, when we were not working for Him, when we had no, no ability whatsoever to please Him, God called us by grace. And so there's the emphasis on his authority as a messenger of God sent by the Holy Spirit. But in Thessalonians, both epistles, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he doesn't use any title. He's just, he's just one of them. And the Holy Spirit is using him to bring messages of comfort, messages of encouragement, and the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we get to 1 Timothy, and there he's an apostle, both in 1 and 2 Timothy. It's Paul the apostle there with the authority vested in him by the Holy Spirit. He's commissioning Timothy for a message of the gospel of grace. In Titus, he's a slave and an apostle. And the last of the 13 is Philemon, and he's a prisoner. Now, it seems to me immediately we've set the tone for this little letter. If we were to translate that in modern day English, I believe our translation would be Jesus Christ's prisoner. Now, there's been all kinds of TV programs and movies, you know, written on bounty hunters and, and FBI and marshals and sheriffs and, and Texas Rangers and, you know, God knows what else, who have taken people captive, taken them prisoner. Sometimes the, the prisoners escape. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they lead those authorities on a merry little chase. What do you suppose it would be like to be the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is close to the end of his human life. Those things are, are much more difficult to comprehend when we're, you know, 20 and 30 years old, but it won't be long until Paul is in the presence of God. We have every historical reason in the world to believe that Paul was a relatively wealthy man one writer has said that Paul was able personally to pay the annual wages of every working person in the city of Jerusalem for two years. So relatively speaking, Paul was a wealthy man. We have indications of that in the book of Acts. We know we saw that in the book of Acts. We know that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. We have 
indications that he was in fact a member of the Sanhedrin and that he voted in that capacity that he not only was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but he was a Roman citizen and therefore he enjoyed rights that were much different compared to the treatment of the slave or, or other Jews who were not Roman citizens. And all of a sudden, he's struck down on the road to Damascus. And we are told in Timothy that Paul was struck down as a model, as an example, as a prototype of all who should hereafter believe. That, that, in, that includes us. Well, I, I, I read that in Timothy, and I go back and I look at Paul. He's on his way to Damascus. I don't know what kind of, of an entourage he had. It must have been interesting. And all of a sudden, he's blinded, struck down, and he hears a voice from heaven. Sounds like thunder to others, but he can understand it. And then someone has the gall to tell me that Paul decided that he was a sinner and that he needed a Savior and he accepted Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that under those circumstances, you'll do anything God told you to do. And there he is blinded. There he is on his knees. And there he hears God thundering from heaven and he's now sent to one who is his enemy. And Ananias, of course, is not only Paul's enemy, but, but Paul, more importantly, is Ananias' enemy. And Ananias is convinced that God is making a mistake. And God basically says in very tactful language in, in Acts, shut up, this man's a chosen vessel to me. And I'll show him what great things he must suffer for my sake. When do you suppose that it was in the life of Paul that he decided that he had seen enough? Oh, you know, okay, God, you show me. It's very clear to me. It's clear, it's just as clear as the daylight on my nose. I've been stoned, I've been beaten, I've been imprisoned. That's enough. You've now shown me how great things I must what great things I must suffer for your name's sake. Now all of a sudden Paul is imprisoned in Rome, and there he writes Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon from that prison cell. Sermons have been written, uh, uh, theses have been uh, written in seminaries on whether or not. Paul was out of the will of God when he appealed to Caesar. And all of a sudden, I read in Philemon that he is Jesus Christ's prisoner. If I told you that Christ took him prisoner on the road to Damascus, I'd be lying. Why? Because Paul was separated from his mother's womb. It seems to me that he must have been 50 or more on the age 50 or more on the road to Damascus. So God separated him from his mother's womb and some 50 years has gone by, which well, to God is nothing, but to many of us, it's a lifetime. I have no problem scripturally of, of extending this guardianship, this, this captivity back to his mother's womb in the forefront of my mind always is the sovereignty of God. So why not extend it back to, to the very planting? Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Why can't I see in the expression that the mighty hand of God is the hand that led to the conception in that womb, separated unto Him, I do not believe that there is the remotest possibility that Paul's mother could have had an abortion and that he was known of God before the foundation of the world and that he was as much God's prisoner at the creation, at the formation of Adam, 
at the flood and at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as he is in the writing of this epistle. Until you fully understand that you are Christ's prisoner, you can't sing in jail. You, you can't write the grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be satisfied. You can't be content in whatsoever state you are in. You are therewith to be content. How amazing to know that you, you are Christ's prisoner. Folks, you couldn't have a better captor. You couldn't, have, you couldn't have a more powerful captor. But you know, in the light of all of that consideration, the Lord Jesus Christ is not only a captor, but He is a captor who loves. And Paul could realize that no matter what touched his body, no matter what experience came into his life, no matter what difficulties, no matter what trials, no matter what testings, no matter what temptations that he would encounter along the path that God laid out for him, he was Christ's prisoner. Can I do with my own as I please, says the Lord? Well, the answer must be a, 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 a battleship 10-inch gun blast, a deafening yes. If you know that you are Christ's prisoner, then you know you are right where He puts you. You're in the situation that is best for you. He's guarded your path. He's directed your steps. And if you are His prisoner, He hasn't forsaken you. Implicit in the expression is His constant guarding and protection. Who can come through the bars established by Christ without His permission after a life of suffering, being stoned, left for dead, beaten three times, 40 lashes minus one, which is the limit of the law? He wrote, the time of my departure is at hand and, and soon He's to be executed. Not some death where He would you know, lie in state, you know, and be honored you know, as, as some beloved dignitary. When Paul wrote this letter through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there were men like Nero and Pilate and Herod. There were councils going on and there were wars being fought and financial problems being discussed and business deals being consummated. And the prisoner sits in a, in a Roman cell and they're not even certain of the charges or how to deal with him. And there he sits in criminal injustice. And he can write, he's Christ's prisoner. He's not Rome's prisoner. He's not the prisoner of the Jews. He's not the prisoner of the people. He is Christ's prisoner. The government is incidental. The authorities belong to Christ. And in the certainty of that knowledge, He can write to Philemon and you and I, grace and peace. He can sing in the prison cell to the amazement of the jailer. And He can write, I have found in whatsoever state I am, I can be content. And Christians by the millions quote those verses and they go to church and they study the Bible and they kick against those circumstances and they engineer and they plan. They won't change God's plan or they'll change their comfort and their joy. They'll not be able to write what Paul wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They won't sing in the face of difficulty and they won't laugh in the presence of danger but, but they could. There is not one of you who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ who is not also His prisoner. We're reminded of His words that He'll be a guide even unto death, that He knows the way that we take, that when He has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. I'd rather be the prisoner of Jesus Christ than anything human society could offer me. 
I'd prefer it over health and strength and satisfaction just to rejoice and know that every moment, every action is disciplined, is directed, controlled by the sovereign God who spoke the worlds into existence. The sovereign God who loves me with an undying love. God's sovereignty, without any doubt, folks, is the greatest subject in all of the Word of God, and yet it is the most neglected. Where are the sources of strength and the sources of peace and rest and joy separate from an almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God? Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. A simple statement but fraught with meaning. He's not Rome's prisoner. He's not Israel's prisoner. He's not the prisoner of the Sanhedrin or of the Jewish attorneys. He is the prisoner who belongs to Jesus Christ. And Philemon is to know that Paul is satisfied. He's not distraught. He's not concerned. Please remember that this is being written from a jail cell and Paul will shortly pass into the very presence of, of the one who died for him that he might live. Paul, Christ, prisoner, and Timothy, the brother. Timothy didn't need to be there. You know, I trust that you realize by any, any critical examination of the Scriptures that Timothy was not arrested and sent to Caesar. It's Paul who has been falsely charged and in his appeal as a Roman citizen to trial before Caesar, a right he, of course, had, and to argue whether or not Paul was stepping out of the will of God when he made such a statement is to argue with what's discussed in the very first phrase of this chapter. He's Christ's prisoner. If Christ didn't want His prisoner in Rome, He wouldn't be in Rome. If Christ didn't want His prisoner in Israel, He wouldn't be in Israel. He is Christ's prisoner and He is right where Christ wants Him to be. How else do you suppose Paul could preach to the upper strata of the Roman government? You know, do you, do you suppose it would have worked well for Paul to write letters of introduction and, and, and say, well, you know, I used to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I used to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, I have some financial backing or I had it. You know, now I've lost it in what I preach. And, you know, and I'm now mending tents just in order to support myself. Dearly beloved, God is God. God, of course, could have struck all of the Roman leaders with blindness and leprosy. You know, and said that, you know, well, the only way that you could be healed is to invite Paul here to preach to you. God could have done that. It wouldn't have been good for Paul. It might have been, well, it might have impressed the people of Rome. It surely would have made Paul think that he was, well, the best thing since craft mayonnaise or you know best thing since Moses or Abraham you know super opinions of himself no I have to conclude God did it right in one of the best ways to get the message to the Romans and to write the message that was needed for the other Christians was to have Paul go to Rome as a prisoner that's the way the Lord Jesus Christ sent him Looking at the text, I have every reason to believe that Timothy and his love for Paul followed him. He didn't have to go. He probably would have been more brilliant had he not gone because you know there's always the stigma that would be attached to an accused individual who may or may not be guilty and you know why run the risk of you know additional arrest and confinement? But apparently from the Word of God alone, one concludes that Timothy left his activity and he went to Rome to comfort Paul and to be with him. 
and that he's cooperating with Paul through the Holy Spirit in the writing of this epistle. And so Christ's prisoner and Christ's brother, Timothy, the brother, seems to include a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a writing unto Philemon. And they have two main reasons to write, two tremendous ties between themselves. This individual called Philemon, one that is dearly beloved. You know, there's no conception whatsoever in modern music, modern entertainment, modern literature of the love of, of, that God speaks of. There is a bond between those who are prisoners of Christ that is indescribable. I have more than a few friends who disagree with me. I, th I, think, I think closer to the truth would be most of my friends disagree with me on on lots of points, but there's a love I can't explain. It's a love that defies any concept of today's love. Somehow or another, Christ prisoner Paul and Timothy have come to know Philemon. And there is a bond of Christian fellowship, a bond of Christian love that is born by that relationship to Christ. And there's another bond. He's a fellow laborer. Fellow laborer. Now, I don't know whether they wrote back and forth to find out you know, how many decisions for Christ that they had in the evening service. Or, or Paul, you'd be glad to know that our normal attendance is now up to a thousand. You know, and Paul would have to write back, well, mine's not very big because you know, my, my cell, prison cell is, is only this big. You know, that, that's not the kind of labor. Obviously, Philemon was one who was interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many times over the years I've been asked by people, well, Steve, why go into missionary service if you believe that God is sovereign? If I believe that God is sovereign, that the if is a foolish statement. God is sovereign. If God's not sovereign, God's not God. Let's don't even bring up the if. Since God is sovereign, why go to the mission field? Because I love Him. Because He asked me to go. Folks, God could ride it with the clouds, okay? He could ride it with stars. He could thunder it with a voice from heaven that it'd be heard worldwide. And if you weren't paying attention, well, he, you'd kind of shake the ground a little bit, shake you around a little bit to, to, to get it. Right? But he doesn't do that. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to deliver those who believe. And Philemon is a fellow worker in that exercise. I can't imagine a greater privilege. I cannot imagine anything, dearly beloved, in, in life, and I enjoy my labor in the Word. I, I, I probably enjoy it too much. I'm, I'm a workaholic, I guess, but I really do enjoy it, and that to me pales in, in, into insignificance compared to being allowed by the sovereign God to carry the good news that He cares for and He has provided for His own. What a privilege. What a privilege to learn, to grow in knowledge of Him, to sit back in utter astonishment at, at how He works. There wouldn't be any satisfaction in my life if I could psychologically or emotionally change y'all's way of thinking, but to carry the Word of God and see a life changed, to see joy replace sorrow, to, and peace replace unrest, the tingling anticipation replace depression and dullness, a, a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. Philemon is a fellow laborer with Paul and Timothy. They love him not only because he's a brother in Christ, 
but because he is one also interested in the good news of Jesus Christ. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. This is a fabulous little letter. The second verse, my Bible says, Unto our beloved Aphia, my Greek says, Unto Aphia the sister. Most people believe this to be Philemon's wife, and it may be, but the title that is used is sister. She's a member of this same family, the family and the household of God, and, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Thy house. I recognize they didn't have church buildings back then. I, I believe that the great work of the Holy Spirit is being done in small Bible classes, not mass meetings. I've been in churches where if anybody wanted to start a home Bible study, you know, they had to get the approval of the pastor and the board and, and, and everybody else. And then they had to have a, they, they sort of had to have a spy there, you know, to make sure that they taught truth. Folks, I am no guardian of truth. The Holy Spirit is the guardian of truth. And I believe God works in a mighty way in small groups. One of the most touching, one of the most revealing Bible studies I ever experienced was taught by a cowboy south of Las Cruces, New Mexico, just, just north of the Mexican border. There were six of us in the class there. A meeting in Philemon's home, a family of believers, knit together in love and in service, recognizing the ownership of Jesus Christ, that they were bought with a price. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. We'll pick up there next week. Lord willing, till then, I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.